Today I'm going to discuss psoriatic arthritis as we complete and continue our discussion of the seronegative spinal arthropathies. Really it's a pretty short talk. It would be helpful to review the talk on seronegative spinal arthropathies that I started initially, so this is really part two of that talk. It would also be helpful to understand this if you would review the introduction talk where I talked a little bit about the anatomy of the joint and also the discussion of rheumatoid arthritis and the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis as I do refer to several of those medicines in this discussion. Let us discuss psoriatic arthritis. Basically psoriatic arthritis is a seronegative inflammatory arthritis that occurs or accompanies cutaneous psoriasis. Note that it is seronegative, that means that there's a lack of a rheumatoid factor or antinuclear antibody. Sometimes it can be very difficult to find the psoriasis, and we'll talk about how we seek that out when we talk about examination. Now the problem with psoriatic arthritis is that it can present with several different forms. There can be DIP involvement or distal interphalangeal joint involvement. One can have a peripheral asymmetric oligoarthritis, such as one sees in reactive arthritis, or actually in the large differential diagnosis of monoarthritis. There can be a rheumatoid-like symmetric polyarthritis, and as one could imagine, this makes it difficult sometimes in determining which one has. There can be an arthritis mutilans, which is a peculiar subset of psoriatic arthritis and they can have sacroiliitis, such as we see in ankylosing spondylitis. Now this is the example of the DIP involvement that can occur with psoriatic arthritis. You can see the swelling of the distal interphalangeal joints here. I would submit that this is different than the swelling that one sees with osteoarthritis. In osteoarthritis, if one were to palpate palpate the joint, it would be very hard, whereas in psoriatic arthritis, when we squeeze this, it's sort of soft and smushy. When you squeeze the joint, it's sort of soft and squish, smushy. This is another example of the DIP involvement that can occur with psoriatic arthritis. There is interphalangeal joint involvement here with swelling and one can see the characteristic nail change that can occur with psoriasis. This is an example of ray involvement. What that means is that all the joints of a digit are involved with swelling, such as the, the reason we call it ray is such as sun rays, sort of just streaming out from the center. Another name for this is sausage digit, is it can look like a sausage. So this is a sausage finger. This is another example of a sausage finger, although not quite as remarkable. And this is a sausage toe. And in this picture, one can also see some characteristic nail dysplasia that again can occur with psoriasis. It can present as an asymmetric oligoarthritis with just one or a few joints involved such as we see in reactive arthritis or again the large differential diagnosis of monoarthritis. In this picture we do see swelling of the knees, the right greater than the left, and that there is plaque formation of the left fore, foreleg, a psoriaform plaque. This is the peculiar subset of psoriasis called arthritis mutilans. As one can imagine this can be devastating and lead to a great loss of function. And when we look at the x-rays, we'll see that there's a great deal of damage going on in these joints. This is the telescoping digits that can occur with arthritis mutilans. And what we see here is there's actually retraction of the digit due to osteolysis of the bone. The reason it's called telescoping digits refers back to like the old telescopes one would have in their Captain Crunch box, which would focus by sliding the scope in and out, because these look like the scope is slid in. Another name for this is opera glass hands, because apparently focusing in opera glass, the little binoculars people use to watch the opera, occurs from sliding the scope in and out also. This is the ankylosing spondylitis type picture that can occur with psoriatic arthritis. 
In this gentleman, he has fixation of the dorsal spine and the lumbar spine. There's no, there, he maintains his lumbar lordosis. Now, we can't test that because we can't bend him over, but if we did, we'd see that he doesn't lose lumbar lordosis with reaching down to touch his toes. In addition, there's a psoriaform plaque on his abdomen. The skin changes associated with psoriasis must be carefully looked for. Some patients come in and are easy and they will tell you I have psoriasis if you ask them or when you take their past history, but some patients don't recognize it. So it's important to look in, in areas that they don't think about, specifically the periumbilical area is shown here is an area where psoriasis can manifest and the patient might not recognize it on the backs of the elbows or the tops of the knees is another area. The intergluteal area is also another area that patients don't see, they can't recognize, but one can see clues of psoriatic arthritis. So it is sort of important to get around to the back and look in the, in the buttock just to see if there is clues of psoriasis there. Nail involvement can give a clue of psoriatic arthritis and, and this is sort of subtle but what one sees here is just sort of little pitting changes and again that's a clue that the patient may have psoriasis and can help in the differential diagnosis of an inflammatory arthritis. There's certain radiologic features uh, when we take the x-ray uh, of patients with psoriatic arthritis and I just they're described here where there's distal interphalangeal joint involvement or DIP involvement with erosion at the base of the terminal phalanx and then there can be osteolysis just proximal to that. Arthritis mutilans can give a pencil and cup appearance and we'll look at that. Again, we talked about the oligoarthritis and the sacroiliac arthritis, and they can have the syndesmophytes without sacroiliitis. In other words, you may see calcification like of the annulus fibrosis. This is just the classic pencil and cup that one sees on x-ray, especially like in DIP involvement or arthritis mutilans. Again, you can sort of see that there's osteolysis of the distal middle phalanx and then sort of flaring of the tuft here. In this x-ray, we have a patient, there's sort of the pencil of cup deformity here. You can sort of see this has sort of been eroded with sort of the flaring of the distal part of the joint. One also sees that there's fusion of several of the joints of the PIPs of several of the joints. This is more subtle, but again, you sort of see some erosion here and you see some flaring the distal joint. Again, you can see little erosions here, and then it almost looks like an osteophyte or a spur. So that would be hard to differentiate between osteoarthritis, this x-ray, and an osteoarthritic joint. This is arthritis mutilans, and we looked at that just a minute ago where we saw the, the telescoping of the digits. You can sort of see how that's occurring. There's just an, a lot of osteo osteolysis of this proximal phalanx again with the pencil and cup deforming it's just the fingers are just sort of dissolving downward. This is just an example of sacroiliitis and psoriatic arthritis and again it, I, I would submit it doesn't look any different than what we see in ankylosing spondylitis and again this is an example of the bamboo spine. So how do we make the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis? This is the current ASA classification criteria for spondyloarthritis, and if you look at either for the sacroiliitis or HLA B27 associated definition, you only need sacroiliitis plus psoriasis in order to classify. In patients with peripheral arthritis only, you only need arthritis or enthesitis or dactylitis with psoriasis in order to classify. So that's per the current ASAS de definition. Now this look a bit at the differential diagnosis of these. With respect to DIP involvement primarily, obviously that would include osteoarthritis, which has DIP involvement. Although again, we discussed how there is a different feel to the joint on physical examination. With peripheral, Asymmetric oligoarthritis, the differential can be very broad. We can consider the other seronegative 
affect spondyl arthropathy, such as reactive arthritis, which can have an asymmetric oligoarthritis. We, consider the, we can consider the crystal-induced arthritis, such as gout or pseudogout, and this can be in the differential also of septic arthritis. So there's, a, there's many things that need to be considered if it's just a posse arthritis or just a few joints. The rheumatoid-like symmetric polyarthritis, obviously we consider rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate. If you have a patient that has an inflammatory polyarthritis with psoriaform lesions, with a rheumatoid factor, how do you classify it? I mean, they're not seronegative, but they have psoriaform lesions. Fortunately, it probably doesn't matter because our treatment options are very much the same. And so I must admit I don't stress over this a lot. If they have an inflammatory polyarthritis that's symmetric with psoriaform lesions, whether it is rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis because my treatments are the same. As we discuss, when, as we will discuss when we get to the treatments, there are a few other medications that are currently approved by the FDA for psoriatic arthritis, which are not approved for rheumatoid. However, as time moves forward, we're finding that these medicines are being tested in rheumatoid patients and many times will help them also. Arthritis mutilans, as we discussed, is sort of unique to psoriatic arthritis. I suppose it would be in the differential of rheumatoid arthritis if there is not a lot of damage. But when one gets to the point where one has like the opera glass joints or hands or the spyglass hands, really we don't see that degree of erosion in rheumatoid very often. And then lastly, the sacroiliitis can look like ankylosing spondylitis, although as per our current classification of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, again, it probably doesn't matter with respect to treatment. So let's discuss the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. In this condition, the approach to treatment is very dependent on which type of arthritis presents or which form the arthritis presents. For instance, one would be much less aggressive in their management for DIP involvement versus arthritis mutilans. Likewise, if they present with an ankylosing spondylitis type of picture, the treatment would be more like ankylosing spondylitis, whereas if they present with a polyarthritis that looks like rheumatoid arthritis, the treatment would be more like the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Specific steps. Occupational therapy is very important for hand problems of rheumatoid. It is also for psoriatic arthritis. And you can imagine if, if they have arthritis mutilans, occupational therapy would be important in helping them to find ways to get around problems that have occurred from the joints dissolving. With respect to patients that have spinal involvement, attention to posture and range of motion is important. Now, for patients with mild disease, I'll typically use non anti-inflammatory drugs first, in particular patients that just have DIP involvement or uh, posse arthritis with one or two joints. Likewise, if it's a posse arthritis, injection of the joint can be helpful. If they have multiple joints or if they're not responding to the non then I will consider the classic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, including methotrexate, leflunamide, sulfazalzine, or azathioprine. More often, methotrexate or leflunamide are used. Again, if it's more of a spondylitis-type picture, typically methotrexate and these medicines don't help, and one needs to move forward to the TNF blockers. There's a more complete discussion of the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs in my talk on the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. With respect to bi biologic therapies, of interest is that multiple cytokine blockers have been studied in the treatment of psoriasis and have been found to be helpful. And so we're going to go through a list of the cytokines or cellular messengers and talk about what's been used, but these have been helpful. Many of these have also found their way into the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but not all of them, although 
I would state that as we move forward, a lot of times medicines which we have been found to be helpful in the treatment of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis are studying in rheumatoid and eventually found to be of use. As with rheumatoid arthritis, the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, etanercept, infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, and sirtolizumab are helpful in the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. The IL-17A inhibitors, secukinumab and ixikizumab, have been shown to be helpful in the treatment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. The IL-17 inhibitor, bradley Bradalumumab has been shown to be helpful in the treatment of psoriasis but not psoriatic arthritis and we will see in the future if they find that this is useful for psoriatic arthritis also. One of the challenges of this medicine is that it can cause suicidal ideation. With respect to IL-23, guselkumab or tremphia has been useful. With respect to IL-17, slash 23, ustekinumab or stelera has been helpful. And then there's a T-cell co-stimulation modulator called abatacep or orincia, which was used initially for rheumatoid arthritis, but has been found to be helpful in the treatment of psoriatic arthritis. Just a list of what the name brands of these are. Etanercept is Imbro, Infliximab is Rimicade, or there's now generic equivalent called Inflectra. Adalimumab is Umira, Golimumab is Symponi, and Sertolizumab is Simzia. The IL-17A inhibitor Secukinumab is Cosyntix, Ixikizumab is Taltz, and then Bradalumumab is Silic. There's medicines that affect cytokine function but are not biologic. One is Aprimilast or, or Tesla, which is a PDE4 inhibitor. And in doing inhibition of PDE4, this is involved in the production of cyclic AMP. And because of this, the cytokines IL-17F, IL-17A, IL-22, and TNF-alpha are decreased and thus this has been helpful in the treatment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Likewise, the Janus kinase inhibitor, which we discussed under rheumatoid arthritis, tofacitinib or Zeljans can be of help. With respect to prognosis, the patients that have just a few joints involved could pot, can sometimes recover completely, and sometimes a non or an injection in the joint or a course of a disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug can get the disease under control and the medicines can be stopped. However, up to 35% of patients can have major disability and obviously those patients we're going to treat very aggressively and as long as it takes to get control of the disease and try to maintain control of the disease. With respect to monitoring, serial examinations are done to assess activity of the joints and if disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs are being used, such as methotrexate, or many of the medicines, follow-up is required in order to monitor for side effects of the medicines. This completes my discussion of psoriatic arthritis, and I hope to see you again later. Well, that completes our discussion of psoriatic arthritis. Today we discussed how psoriatic arthritis can look like several of the different arthritis conditions and indeed is in the differential diagnosis of many arthritis conditions. We did a, have a little discussion of the treatment of psoriatic arthritis and in particular we talked about how many of the cytokines that sort of signal or drive the immune system have been looked at in psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis and that blocking many of these and we gave several examples seems to affect the outcome and has a good response for the disease. I again thank you for listening to my lectures. Uh, there will be more to follow. I hope these are useful to you. Thank you very much.